Kevin Cohen. Uh, today we'll be running through basically habitual dependence and gamification of products. So this is in essence a way to basically get people coming back a bit more habitually and try to build a bit of a habit to coming back to your product, your app, whatever it may be. Uh, and you would have heard a lot of these theories and applications before in things like apps and games, but you'll see also as I run through this how you've most likely been um, susceptible to this in things like your workday life, going to McDonald's, pretty much anything, and you've probably come across this loop before and how it actually tricks you into coming back a bit more habitually. But first off, it's a bit of background about myself and, oh, too far first, um, a bit of background about myself and Diaz, so I'm not sure if any of you are here for Pete's session as well, but I'm from Diaz, uh, and we are on the consulting side of things, mostly for bleeding edge tech and a lot of other emerging products. Uh, my role is around the, as people say, the hand wavy uh, agile business side of things. Um, trying to get a bit into the coding side myself as well, dabble in my own time. And in my own personal side of things as well, I'm a very big gamer and I keep up with gaming news and development as well. In terms of what we'll run through today, a uh, bit of an introduction obviously is myself, who this is for and why should you guys believe me? How do I know what I'm talking about? Habitual dependence, what it actually is and where it started where it's used, use cases, and if we have time and activity, because we're a bit behind, and long-term effects and some of the legal factors as well. That's definitely good to keep in mind, especially in the last year or two, how these are getting a bit more testing and complicated, but we'll get to that. So the goals for this session are really to hopefully educate you on that loop, display where it's being used and how effectively it can be, the good versus evil in addiction, which is a very important point, the long-term effects and legal factors as mentioned, and any questions you might have. And do feel free to shout out and ask questions as we go on further, a bit of a back and forth. So my background, how do I know what I'm talking about? So first of all, my uh, degree from Deakin is in the background of games design and development, so I've got a bit of a coding design experience there. I found when going through the course, I wasn't one of those developers who just pick it up and was amazing with it and like straight away, it took me a bit of trying, so I was like, okay, well, I understand it, so let me just take a step back and see if I can work with the guys. From there, uh, my first job was at Appster, which you may have heard in the news a lot recently, but I initially joined them back when it was probably uh, five or six people, and by the time I left was one or two years before they closed, and that was around 400 people. So got to see a lot of that rapid growth and a lot of that um, early scaling, trying to scale that enterprise side of things. And now my time's at DS, and I spent a lot of my spare time around game development working with others there as well. So let's get into it. So basically, where did this first come about? So first of all, the habitual dependence element or basically making a habit of a product is only one part of the full cycle because really, you're gonna to need to get people into your product, which is really that acquisition activation side of things. The retention or churn is really keeping them there for a long period of time, which is a different sort of scenario. And the revenue and the virality slash referral is again slightly different. So revenue, obviously, how do you make money after time? And the referral virality should be your marketing avenues down the road in terms of getting your, your customers to hopefully talk to like each other and to refer them to their friends. Um, and does anyone want to take a guess at why it's called pirate metrics? Anyone know? ARR. Yes. <laughs> it's literally because it's acquisition, activation, retention, revenue. It's R. <laughs> Terrible. Um, that will move on from there. So today we'll be talking about that engagement habitual dependence, which is that loop in there. So, first of all, where's it used? Pretty much everywhere. Uh, you would have come across it, whether you know it or not, again, and everything from your actual even your emails and actually how they're laid out and the way you come back to those and actually build up cycles there. Coffee rewards, which is probably one of your simple obvious ones, which is going to cafes and how it builds a bit of a habit for you coming back. And even things like McDonald's um, and obviously all your various video games, be they MMOs, puzzles, card games, anything. Um, but especially products like McDonald's and those sort of things, the ones that you might not have always been aware of, but you'll definitely start to see after today's session how they try to put that loop out to you, and not only to yourselves, but obviously kids and that sort of thing as well, to try and make mom and dad come back a bit more habitually. So what is it? So to begin with, um, it came about probably in the scary days of psychology, uh, before we got to more of the positive side that we do these days in the last decade or two. Uh, this was really early 1900s sort of stuff, looking at the really sort of factual physical side of how the brain worked and how it's ticking and that sort of stuff. And doing some of the less um, sort of nice things back in those days, but we learned a lot of the stuff and how the brain ticks because of that. Uh, and it comes into the triggers in the brain, and I'll go through 
each section independently, and then we'll look at the, the loop as a whole and give you a color. But it all begins with this trigger. So effectively, a trigger, in essence, is can be internal or external. So obvious internal triggers for anything you want to do is like, it could be hunger, food, could be boredom, the, uh, just like wanting to watch the epic show, or one that's probably really common these days is FOMO, or fear of missing out, which is probably the main thing that makes people come back to Facebook, Instagram, why can't you delete your Instagram? Oh, but I might miss something, or someone's birthday, I won't remember. Like, it's that constant fear of, that's the only reason people won't delete their social media half the time. And then external triggers are obvious things that make you just tweak that you're like, you want to have a look at that, or driving past a Macca's side and being like, oh yeah, actually that would be good, or the little notification symbol on your emails, things like that are those external triggers that make you start thinking in your brain and you'll see how this works. But this thing in your brain that'll start getting the dopamine cycling in certain areas and start going like, oh wait, there's a reward at the end of that and the cycle starts to begin. But we'll start moving through that. So after the trigger comes the routine. So you've decided whatever that trigger was incentivizing, you now want that reward, whatever it may be. So first you're gonna go through the routine. Now, even something like work actually does have a routine trigger reward <laughs> scenario, and we'll get to that. But obvious things like um, somebody looking at social media, a routine would be literally scrolling through Facebook or Instagram and looking for something interesting. Like the amount of time you just scroll through, going past stuff, don't really care, that's the routine. This is where your brain almost goes into an autoplay sense and you just sort of do things naturally. That's that driving to work where it becomes muscle memory or even playing certain levels in Candy Crush if you get stuck, something like that. It's the routine of going through that action. With that, uh, is this is the really important part, is when there is a routine that you have to get to that reward, you have to make sure those barriers to entry aren't too hard and that they actually have motivation to reach that. Otherwise, those triggers will completely fail in the first place. So a good example of uh, where a trigger might fail is, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example, um, Say there's um, the new, like you know how they have the Olympic Cups and that sort of stuff for matters on the Olympic years and that sort of thing. Say if it's a particular one that's come back before, or um, say from a uh, ability point of view, the closest McDonald's to you is 100 kilometers away because you live in the country. Now obviously as that, like the actual ability to be able to do this like gets harder and harder, the likelihood that the trigger is gonna fail becomes a much likely source. Well again, similar for the motivation, if you really like the Olympics, but you really don't care too much, your motivation's gonna to be too low to bother actually hitting any of these triggers in the first place. So obviously the more motivation you have, the more likely you are going to push to try and get that like that result. But otherwise, it's gonna to have to make sure, make sure your, your customer or whoever it may be is actually motivated about what it is, and the ability, there's low barriers to entry to start that process. And hopefully that trigger should work, we'll make them think about it, go have a quick look. And we'll start seeing how that becomes a bit more effective shortly. So after the routine, we get to the reward. Now this is where it comes back to that old creepy psychology side of things, and this is where we started to learn how this stuff works. And you will very quickly see where this has come about in something else very common that people can get addicted to. But basically, going through the routine, you get to your reward. Now, initially we found, uh, we thought like doing a reward, say like every second time, would be enough to make you keep coming back and want to get that reward. So in the old days, um, with the tests that were running, they had a rat hit a button, and a light would come on, and cheese would come out. Then it would hit the button again, light would come on, but no cheese. And it would just do that every second time in a fixed pattern. Now when it did that in a fixed pattern, all that ended up happening was after a period of time, it learned that's where it got food, and it would stop when it got full. Simple enough. So they decided to change it up a bit. And this time, they changed it so it would on average happen every second time, but it was effectively random. So it was basically on average every second time it happened, but it might be two cheeses, none, cheese, no cheese for three, another. And all of a sudden, this reinforcement made it go nuts. It literally kept eating until the rat got sick. So it didn't stop until it actually got physically sick. It didn't stop when it was full anymore. Um, and this ties into basically what happens when we have that variable scenario is we get these dopamine triggers. So this is what becomes really important is that variability because now you're not sure it's starting to do this uh, trigger dopamine scenario. So what ends up happening is this is the first time you go through like a loop or um, that first sort of scenario. So it's like you click on something, See the first section of whatever that reward may be or whatever that routine may be. Second section, and then you get your reward, the chocolate. Now the first time, your dopamine's just generally spiking, and for context, any of those who don't know, dopamine being sort of effectively the happiness drug in the brain or what makes you feel good. And initially, it would just be triggering all over the place because you're not sure of that process, oops. But then once you start going through it, this is what would happen once you build that routine. 
you see that trigger, you get a massive dopamine spike straight away because you know that there's that possible variable or reward at the end. But then when you get to that routine, it just goes into, a, again, your brain pretty much goes into a muscle memory state of just routine, blows down, um, and you can just get through that action. And then as soon as it gets back to that variable reward, another massive spike at the top. Now, this is the reason that that variability becomes really important. Um, and probably the most obvious place you've seen that is gambling. Uh, in the sense that you go to the pokies, slot machines, anything like that, pull the bar. Now, if you won every second time, um, sure, like maybe it'd be kind of fun, but there's actually a Twilight Zone episode, I believe, where it actually did that, where someone goes um, and they're pulling the pokies machine, it's like, yes, I win. And they keep winning. They're like, oh no, I win every time. This must be hell. Like effectively for a gambler, that's hell, winning every time and not having that chance of risk or not having that variability. So that's where that variability becomes quite important. And in terms of the reward types, now this is where you have to know your customer base a bit more. I could easily do a session completely on just reward types and how to sort of look for those. But basically getting to know your customers, you'll get an idea of what sort of things they're after as to the major rewards they need. Looking at it from a game point of view, you can often um, basically shrink them down to socializers, so people who like interacting with others, talking in games like your MMOs, that sort of thing. Your killers, which straightforward, that's your first person shooters, like being really competitive PvP, getting into the battlegrounds. Knowledge seekings, that's like your puzzlers, the ones who enjoy sort of just finding and exploring all the time. And achievers or security seeking, so achievers are your, obviously the ones like ticking all the boxes, getting 100%, completing something all the way. Now, these obviously also apply the other way around into various products as well, but just getting to know your customers will hopefully start bringing out these a lot more clearer. And it does have the personality types there if you want to look into that side of it as well. But I wouldn't take it too accurately. More likely just best to talk to them and get to know them. Now after the reward or the variable reward, the last part of the loop is the investment. Now this is also arguably probably one of the parts a lot of people miss, um, but is also one of the most important as this is the thing that will bring you back that next time. And a really good investment will actually lead to the next trigger. So what I mean by that is, we'll just look at some general investments to start with. So Instagram, an obvious one, and the investment is effectively the posts, followers, following the numbers that trigger. So again, the main reason you don't want to go and delete your Instagram is, oh, but I've got like 5,000 followers now, or I've got like this sort of thing. So that investment is building up. You feel like there's worth you put into that, time you put into that. Same for your Facebook. Um, even for a lot of demographics that aren't huge into the actual, say, talking side, won't delete their Facebook because, oh, but that's where I've stored all my photos now. It's now the investment of having stored all their images in there, and it's got that history of what happened every year. Similar for Facebook, obviously your likes, timeline. Spotify. I'm actually um, a big advocate of Spotify, like I use it all the time, this sort of thing. And it's actually one of those Stockholm syndromes. I didn't realize till recently when talking with some of our UXs at uh, DS and this sort of thing, but Spotify is actually a terrible platform in terms of UX. It's actually really, really bad UX-wise. It's actually really hard to find the stuff you're looking for and make great like sort of lists and this sort of thing. But I just never tweaked because I'm now so Stockholm Syndrome, I can't change. My playlist is over like 1,300 songs now. Like there's no way I'm gonna try and convert that one by one into another like media streamer. So my investment there is way too heavy. I can't leave Spotify now unless I wanna put hours of effort into changing that. <coughs> And similar, obviously LinkedIn, again similar, but now more an investment into your work life. So again, you're not gonna to swap to another professional-based social network system once you've got all the followers, all the actual like int, um, actual professionals that you work with back and forth. And last but not least, one of my favorites is Apple. Uh, Apple effectively, their investment is having the Apple products and having the Apple home. My fiance's sister, even though she's not a huge fan of her phone anymore, says she won't talk to Android because she's got too much like stuff in iTunes and has bought too much stuff in all the Apple products. So now she's just too invested in the Apple life system. But the important part is the investment returns. So what comes back from those? Now, the most classic one you would have seen in the first iterations of these back when Facebook was starting was probably Farmville. And the idea that if you didn't come back to your investment, you would lose all of that. And effectively lose all of your crops, lose everything you put into that. So now it's like, no, I've just like lost all the stuff I put into that. I have to keep making sure I come back so I don't lose that investment. Otherwise, it feels like you're losing a bit of work from that. Similar for Facebook and Spotify as to how they sort of make you come back and have that return element is again, Facebook obviously from the element of the fear of missing out and deliberately using all these different types of notifications to tell you how oh, these people looking to make friends talk or actually just different news and information 
each of their own sort of triggers designed to hit different parts of the brain to make you go, oh, but I have to go check that, or who's going to be adding me now, or like various things, <laughs> keep doing that, various things to keep drawing you back to that. And last but not least, again, for my Spotify um, example, is the release radar. So I'm not sure if many of you use uh, Spotify as much as I do, which I've probably been using three, four years now every day. <coughs> But the release radar um, is for bands you follow, or there's also the discovery um, discovery playlist, which just builds off things you've listened to over long periods of time and suggests things, which now I absolutely love. But initially, it wasn't great. But having listened to and used it every day for three or four years, it's actually got a lot of good recommendations. So now I come back every week on the Monday, and I know it changes and updates on the Monday for like, oh, here's your new like weekly playlist for the new discoveries. So I'm like, oh, awesome. And I go through those every Monday which is ridiculous, like I shouldn't have to do that, but it's now being built into my brain so much of that habit. So this is the, the loop overall. So basically to recap it, it's that trigger that first gets you that spike of like, all right, so what am I looking for? Using McDonald's as our example, the trigger is that walk, uh, actually driving past a Macca's sign or something similar. The action, which is then, all right, so I know I'm hungry, I want to go, I can't be bothered cooking, so yeah, we'll drive there, that's the routine. That variable reward, again, the variable being the important, of, okay, so is it in terms of the adult going to Macca's, it might not be too variable, but sometimes it's like, oh, it's just easy, I don't have to worry about looking after the kids, or I can just like go and rest, I have to worry about cooking. And that investment, maybe less so on the adult side, but let's do this loop again now for the kids. So the kids get their trigger of, okay, a toy, um, they see it on their dad, they want to go out. The action or routine for them is now going out and eating, that's the boring part. Now the variable reward, is one of those six collectible toys that's part of a collection. Now they get one of those. Now what happens as they take that toy home, that toy becomes the next investment because now they're staring at that one toy in the collection and they're looking at it the next day and like, oh man, but I really want the other one that goes with that. So that becomes the next trigger, which then causes them to go back to then so on. So again, as mentioned, the investment should, if designed well, effectively be a trigger to try and keep you coming back and going through that loop and getting more and more used to it. Now, why do we need to use this, if that's the case? This is using apps as an example, so mobile apps. But the general retention rate, if you change this to like the 100% of day one, day 10, and so on, this would be the equivalent that after 10 days, basically you only have about 20% of whatever your day one um, customers were there, or your users were there, especially with applications. Uh, and you might think that's a bit odd, but think about your phone. I may have 20 or 30 apps installed, but I probably use six max every day, um, and that's just like your usual banking, music, that sort of thing. And so to actually have someone build in that habit, this becomes really important really fast. Otherwise, day 90, 1.7% of the original users are actually still around. So it's a very quick drop off rate, especially if you don't have that habit, because again, unless it's sitting on your front of your home page, which many people want actually don't want that because they like a nice design, a nice clean layout, it can be sitting in the background, so it's not being radiated to you, it's not being advertised to you, and it doesn't have that trigger unless it's a notification. Which again, even that's trickier these days, depending on what permissions you get. So we do need something to keep bringing people back in those early cycles, otherwise they're going to disappear very quickly. But we're now talking about all this and the addiction side, so what is the bad use cases of this? Where should you actually be cautious? And this is where you need to bring in some of that ethical consideration, which I'm a big advocate for. So it may sound strange I'm talking about how to get people addicted to stuff, when I'm basically saying the ethics is really important, and we'll get into that, as where's the good use cases? How can you use this as a good case? But this is some of the bad use cases. So using the, the whale chart here, you may have heard before, obviously mobile games and games <coughs> in general will often put all of their revenue streams into what's called the whales. That's where they want, that's where they get most of their revenue. And that actually comes from 1% of people who might spend greater than 50 bucks a month or even like 68, $70 a month on games every month in terms of microtransactions. Um, for one particular game in this case. So the average person, like, I've obviously spent some money on microtransactions here or there on various games, like a Marvel Puzzle Quest, I think one stage I was playing, or um, you always have those little games you want to try something in. Um, and I maybe spent over the course of a year $50, $60, which in my mind is like, eh, that's the price of a full-fledged game if I'm playing that for a year, that feels justified. So, but I'm one of these, like, minnows, effectively, just paying it on average, you know, your normal gamer. And so if they relied on these types of people, their revenue streams would be really low, but it's the fact that they put their onus on the whales who basically have these addiction problems, almost have gambling problems, that makes them like end up attracting so much. An example of this is this was a couple of weeks ago, but FIFA, um, which is a massive soccer game, 
borderline everyone I know has it at some point, uh, if you haven't heard of it, but FIFA players, they use the new GDPR rules to find out everything that EA has on him and realize he'd spent over $10,000 in two years on one game mode in one game. Um, and he didn't know how much he was spending because, again, very common tactic for lots of games, but converting your real currency into another currency, so then when you're spending that currency, you don't know how much you're actually spending, and lots of scenarios there. But he had to use his GDPR to make them tell him how much he'd actually spent. Um, and he was the one that actually ended up reporting afterwards that he thought this was safe because he actually ended up buying a PlayStation in various games because he, used, he was a gambler and had gambling addiction, so he was trying to not go gambling. And in the end, got roped into this by accident. And tying into that, as another example, is actually, um, and this is just like an inf uh, interesting information point personally, but it's actually um, alcohol. Alcohol, the alcohol industry in itself actually works the same way. 80% of um, revenue, I think it is, is 80% or 20%, a large chunk of um, basically the profits that alcohol companies make, they make from harmful or alcoholic drinkers, which is quite sad to think, but yeah, most of the alcohol industry makes its revenue from alcoholics. <laughs> so you can start to see how this addiction has really been around for quite a while in these loops, but now we're only really starting to see them much more obviously, and hopefully you'll see them a bit clearer yourselves after today's session as well. So how can we use these powers for good then? So what's, what's actually the good cases? Where can we use this? Why is this actually good to know? Well, in a couple of cases, probably the best primary example recently was Pokemon Go. Obviously it had all of these loops built in, the notifications, the variable rewards, finding the various ones, getting out there. But now all of a sudden, that routine and the, the incentivization is having to exercise. That's effectively the routine. <laughs> and in my mind, that's not a bad loop, effectively. As long as you're actually enjoying it and you're getting out, you're exercising it. This is something that Michelle Obama, even herself, um, was a big advocate of, just because it's getting kids out there. And I think that's a pretty an example of where those loops need to be used, actually encourage us to enjoy things that we usually wouldn't. And as a great example for parents, even doing something similar like, um, having various hobbies and then having the idea of variable rewards based on what you get or how well you do, that sort of thing. But it will get kids or you get even adults or anyone in that sort of nice mindset. Because you've got to remember, and this is one of the main points I have to sort of often incentivize or actually highlight to people, is that effectively these dopamine spikes and this loop and that sort of thing isn't inherently evil. This is, you get the same dopamine spikes from a hug from a loving friend or from a warm shower in the morning or something like that. These are not inherently unnatural processes or something that's inherently evil. It's just the way that they've tied it to and what they, what you want them to become addicted to. Do you want them to become addicted to hopefully exercising and having fun or do you want them to become addicted to spending hundreds of dollars every week on a game? Hopefully you've got a bit more ethics than some of the companies I know. Uh, other good use cases as well, just to sort of expand that and not think, okay, it's pretty limited. There's obviously like water drink reminders, medication trackers. Anything you can sort of build loops into and actually have rewards, it could be like whatever those you can think of, but there is lots of ways to build really good loops and really good um, elements into lots of things that we generally day to day probably need to incentivize ourselves a bit more and encourage ourselves with. All right, um, now the room's not the best set up for the activity, unfortunately, um, but we'll see how we go. I might get groups of four if possible, if people can move across. But basically what I've done is I've printed out various sheets with a few different ideas on them uh, and some blank paper. And basically what I want you to do is spend five minutes probably on your own, uh, just noting down using either the product idea I've supplied or you can use your own idea. And just note down some various ideas of triggers, routines, that reward and investment that you can come up with. And then as a group, I'll say groups of four, uh, just sort of discuss together what you think would be the, what's the best methods you might use taking that forward and what you might actually say, pitch the bosses, that sort of thing, and try to group them into, okay, is this a good, uh, are we incentivizing something good here, is it just incentivizing something neutral, which is coming back to the product, or are we incentivizing something bad here, which depends on how you define as bad, but that could be more things of like, are we just getting them to spend money constantly, or is it hopefully getting them to be aware of how much they're spending over time and actually enjoying the product. So I'll pass these out there. Spend 10 minutes on this, just keep your eyes on them.
So I'll give everyone 10 minutes and then we'll get everyone to sort of check out their ideas. Things lots, yeah. lots of people taking photos, which is a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm used to running this at this stuff, so yeah, I'll be more natural and don't just stress too much. Which is good. As a heads up, we'll give it five more minutes. Thank <laughs> you. 
dangerous. Skill dangerous. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We might start sharing around, just keeping an eye, and I've got a couple more slides after this. So I'll do a quick run around, see if we've got any interesting ones. So have we got any interesting ones? Uh, what's the idea here to start with? We have two ideas. Two ideas, yep. Yeah. So we haven't shared everything Oh, that's okay. Uh, do we want to start with the first one? Okay. So um, this was an exercise application which talks you through doing your runs every morning and some core exercises. And um, so the trigger could be something like a pop-up uh, reminder that's actually an avatar, and um, so you can do different routines. Um, you do, and then the a routine is you go for the walk, you do the exercise. Um, the variable reward could be um, you know, different points for different things that you do, but also um, the investment is um, the points to, can translate to different things you can give to your avatar. Clothing, accessories, and that draws you back. Yeah, I like that. So that way, and like as you're improving yourself, you're also almost seeing it reflected in the avatar, which is also good for something like exercise, where it will take six months to see that result. So this is yeah. that sort of that small progress change. Yeah. Okay. Uh, was there a second idea there? Yeah, there was. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> What was the idea first, sorry? Um, I had the task of getting people to come back to my restaurant. Um, I run a pizza restaurant. Um, and uh, after doing it, I questioned my equitable call, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I just went like the classic leaderboard, the point system, so and, and um, sharing. So if you came into my restaurant and then you shared or put a review, um, there was a waiting system on how many likes or what platform if you use different platform from last time we got more points and then there was a leaderboard and getting a bit of a local community and competing against each other for one pizza. That's cool. So almost having a, a discount based on how much you share and get followers and that sort of thing. Yeah, I'm not proud of the scheme, but <laughs> <laughs> No, no, that's still quite good. It's a, an excellent way of sort of building that sort of community focus as well and getting it out there. Cool. Um, was there another idea there, guys? Or yeah, sure? it's not really something that I'm going
you go there and then buy, buy such an amount of food and you can actually put that on the original app, put the information on the, on the app, um, then you get reward. Um, and if you gain the reward, it can be changed, it can be changed to coins. Mm -hmm. Excellent. No, that's excellent. All right. Uh, jump across to this side. Was there anything for you guys? Anything interesting on your side? <laughs> <laughs> what was the idea? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can share the idea. I can okay. Share the idea. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, of course. Um, and then, I, and we we also did uh, a rankings as well as, as a trigger mm -hmm. um, with notifications such as this kind of feature. You know, it's no longer number one anymore. You should get on it. Or yeah. You were twenty last week, but now you're thirty. That's excellent. And as a, a good sort of semi-case study for that, for where that does work really well, um, is I actually had that in my university course. Uh, we, a particular assignment was we had to, we were building AI, um, and our assignment was basically our teachers gave us a pretty restricted version of a um, game where someone could just walk around a map um, and pick up um, items, either decreased or increased your health, and you said to find your way out. And the way we did it was all of us coded our own AI, and whoever got the highest score, that was a leaderboard, and that was how our points were done for our mark for our course. So, And that was a really fun, really engaging way of just seeing that leaderboard and the points changing, like, oh, I can get the best mark if I do this or this. So you can actually make kids interested in studying, which is amazing. Um, but it does take out. <laughs> uh, what about side, side in the middle there? Anything interesting? Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we had uh, a private idea of a driver trying to embrace the ride sharing market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the day-to-day -day life sort of thing. They're traveling every week. I had an example of a person I was doing that Monday to Friday, and I ended up getting the same guy dropped in every week. And that's excellent. And I'm one of those people, I'm not sure if other people are similar, but I'll jump between <clears throat> Um, share riding services based on like, oh, what's cheaper, who's actually around, that sort of thing. Um, but if I had a ride sharing service that would pick me up a coffee before they got there and like knew the coffee I wanted, that sort of stuff, I would stick with them, even if they're more expensive. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's an excellent idea. <laughs> yes. uh, and last but not least, up in the right hand corner, what was our idea and any good ideas that's coming with it? Uh, I'll go. So we had the same one as the first group, which was the exercise application. Pretty much the same outcome with the same notifications or alarms that keeps trying to get you going in the morning and that was the start of the routine. Then the continuation of the routine would be actually doing the exercises. Um, we think of the rewards we could actually be like real world products that you earn through a scoring system. So for example, a boost juice at the end of your workout or something like that if you earn enough points. 
um, educate people investors, we were thinking that you would just record their workout statistics and their progress over time so that it keeps it going. If you don't want to swap apps, you can swap the reports and watch that week. Exactly. Uh, it's excellent. And as you mentioned as well, again, that the reward for the exercise is often the trickiest part because you'd hope the reward is the exercise itself, but because our brains are wide and long-term element of it, it doesn't work that way. So finding a good variable way to keep you doing that would be excellent. Awesome. All right. Um, I'm just out of time, so quickly touching the last two slides. So quickly, just keeping in mind the long-term effects of what is the actual long-term effects of doing these loops and if you're in it for a long period of time. Uh, at this stage, we don't really, we haven't really seen any massive long-term effects. The World Health Organization has recently, and I mean very recently, um, officially classified gaming disorder as an actual disorder. Um, although a lot of people are still disputing this, thinking it could yeah, take some evangelical parents a bit too far with thinking that their <coughs> kids are getting addicted and that sort of thing. But this is more, um, as a quick recap, this is more if it's starting to really affect your day-to-day -day life and you're sacrificing things to do it. You can see the actual um, diagnosis and actual rundown of it there. But we're more getting an idea now that it's more an element of individuals have problems with addiction, not necessarily problems with gambling or gaming or individual things, but it's more an actual problem with addiction itself is becoming more refined. So in terms of long-term, we don't, haven't seen any long-term mental effects of it per se, so, but we'll keep an eye on that and see if we should get concerned. But so far, as mentioned, it's, this is all natural stuff. It's just a way of actually building and becoming that habit. And last but not least, the, uh, the legal factors, which is where I was coming to that good and evil scenario, um, which is where you just really want to keep in mind how you're doing it. So again, mentioning the FIFA scenario of those loot boxes um, and the people spending $10,000 in such a short period of time, some countries are now banning loot boxes because they see this as an equivalent to gambling. So this is the idea that if you do that variable reward um, and it is completely unknown what they'll get or what even the chance of those, um, the chance of getting certain rewards are, um, lots of countries say it's not gambling. Technically, Australia and England have said it's not gambling and we're being used by these companies to say, see, then they said it's not gambling, we can do it, um, which is not great. But <laughs> countries such as uh, Belgium and Norway and I think even Hawaii now are looking to start banning them because they can get absolutely ridiculous and uh, can be very incentivized to heavily push that spending the money. Um, but again, keep that in mind. And if you're ever concerned about, say, building a loop to spend, like monetization or do microtransactions, that's still perfectly fine. Just make sure you have an upper limit on it so people can't spend $800 in a day to do that, or they don't need to spend $100 to the equivalent of a thousand hours of gaming or something like that, depending on what the product is. Excellent. Uh, so hopefully today you've got an idea of what habitual dependence is, the loop that you get taken through for that, the embarrassing name of pirate metrics, um, where it's used, use cases, how you can use it, and the long-term effects and where this is sort of coming about. But hopefully that was useful. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to come up and grab me afterwards. Thanks.